Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're concentrating on the short story The Lady of the House of Love that's a part of The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. I'm going to be considering the context, the themes, the literary methods and trying to make some intertextual links that will hopefully help you as you unpack this text in all its glory. Before I go any further I'd love for you to hit like and of course if you haven't already please join our tribe by hitting subscribe for all things English, literary and grammatical. The story is set in Romania at the dawn of the First World War. Here a vampire countess and her servant live in a castle near an abandoned village. The countess mostly lives from the blood of animals and from the blood of traders who come into this remote area. One day, an attractive young British officer who travels this area by bicycle comes to the village and the servant leads him to the castle. When he meets the Countess, he immediately falls for her and feels the need to help her. The Countess sees more in him than in her other victims, which confuses her. When she tries to undress herself, her glasses fall off and she cuts herself on its pieces. The soldier tries to comfort her and kisses her better. The next morning, the soldier wakes up and finds the Countess dead and looking much older because she turned human. He takes the rose that is lying on the table and leaves. When he's back in England the rose is still alive and he has to leave for France to fight in the war. In our analysis I want to be unpacking the virtue of this soldier but it makes sense to begin our analysis by examining the Countess, the Vampire, herself. This first piece of evidence, examining her grotesque qualities, is fantastic in illustrating Carter's subversion here. Everything about this beautiful and ghastly lady is as it should be. Queen of night, queen of terror, except her horrible reluctance for the role. Carter subverts the Gothic by creating a role that this time the monster is reluctant to be so. We're given that beautiful juxtaposition of the perpetual struggle of this lady being beautiful and acting in a ghastly fashion as a consequence of that. It stresses her evil, her tyrannical power and the connotations of both beautiful and ghastly seem to fit so wonderfully in this idea that she masks her vampire self in the veneer of purity walking around in a wedding dress. The repetition of queen signals also her power over darkness. Those associations of night and terror that she's queen of definitely strike an ominous tone, as does the acknowledgement that both these things are dark forces. And then, as if that weren't enough, we're given a very clear and brief description of how she fits the mould of an archetypal vampire. She's driven by her desires, she is not reconciled by them either. This is a battle for her that we are about to see in all its glory. The area of contention for her is this evident sense that she's matured, she's changing. One of the pivotal themes across this short story is that of metamorphosis. She's blossomed from a girl to a woman, but as a vampire she has needs. We're told when she was a girl she was happy to feed on baby rabbits, voles and field mice, but now she is a woman. She must have men. Carter here is signalling the dual portrayal of this character as a vampire and a woman and we recognise that both cannot win. There is a battle within for which one will survive. But innocence is totally assumed in usual terms with femininity. But in this story, the female character is the powerful object and evil force. Here she is, killing innocent creatures for her own gratification. The image of baby rabbits, voles and field mice strike for me as a reader this notion of freedom that she's crippling 
she's happy to feed on them as a child. We recognise we're meant to see that in sinister terms. As if that weren't enough, we've got this parallel comparison referring to when she was a girl. Now she is a woman. Heightening this metamorphosis again and this evolution of her impulses getting greater and greater, her desires becoming more dangerous. It's ambiguous to what extent she must have men is uh, some sort of carnal uh, sexual obsession or to what extent um, these are actually cannibalistic desires that echo the fact that she'd eat animals. But there's a sense in which this is more than just a hunger for food. This is about a sexual appetite and a sexual awakening, but it comes at the cost of others dying. This particular piece of evidence, and could love free me from the shadows, can a bird sing only the song it knows, echoes the magnificence of Carter's writing. Here, we're drawn into the thought process of the vampire, considering her attraction to the young English soldier. The use of questions shows the struggle as she unpacks her feelings, and it's probing the notion through these questions that embracing your sexual desires can liberate you. That desire to be free from the shadows is a desire to grow, change, be an adult. But metamorphosis and change in this story are drawn together as ideas that lead to the downfall of this character. The reflection in the second question on whether a bird singing only the song it knows emphasises the desire for the vampire to evolve, not just in her actions, but in her thoughts, and dare I say it, the fear that goes alongside that. There are other tools that are used by Carter. I think the giddying sense of shifting intense gives us the impression that our narrator is lost in time. And I think there's also a huge ability for us to understand that there's a transformative power to the nature of this story that links very much to the key themes I'm about to share with you. The Countess is seen as beautiful, but so beautiful she's unreal. And that makes the reversal in the story so powerful. She has no flaw in her face, as it were, but it's so false as a mask. And it's only when she's transformed at the end of the story and dies that her face looks older, less beautiful, and first time for everything, fully human. The reversal at the end of this story confirms again the idea that she was entrapped by the mask and that enlightenment really only comes in her death. That echoes the mask that we see in The Tiger's Bride, proving that she is not what she seems. She's trapped in an invention of darkness. There's a lark in a cage that she's like, and she likes it because she's trapped too. The enlightenment she faces is brief and destructive. The end of exile is the end of being, are the words that Carter uses there. And her enlightenment is acknowledging the feelings she has of sexual desire for the English soldier. But the truth of the matter is she cannot survive in a world of truth and reality. She is too consumed in the world of murder and of bloodshed. But where does that lead us? The apparent symbolism of death as a sexual awakening has a huge potency across this story that subverts so much. If nothing else, we are forced to confront the hollow nature of what beauty provides for the Countess. She walks around surreally in her mother's wedding dress, looking like the image of purity, even though she is cast out from that sense of purity, from her actions. Death regains its corrupt, brilliant, baleful splendour for her. When the Countess bleeds, a being that bleeds, it conjures up images of loss, of virginity and sexual awakening, which definitely, as I've already acknowledged, go together. But the lack of sexual understanding for the Countess is a weakness and the virginity and purity for the soldier is a total strength. 
The narrator explains he's immune to shadow due to his virginity. He has the special quality of virginity, most and least ambiguous of states, ignorance yet at the same time power in potential, and furthermore unknowingness, which is not the same as ignorance. He is more than he knows. So according to our narrator, the sexual and transformative power that's within the soldier is so great because it is untapped. And it definitely fuels this notion that unlike the other male figures across this collection, this man is nurturing. He is good. He doesn't seek to sexually gratify himself through the female character. The roles are reversed here. It's fascinating also that her beauty is a deformity. She's a victim within her own body, a caged animal, if you like. Her own death is already expected, if you like. She's locked in her castle, unable to escape, trapped through her vampirism. Yet the Englishman, his physical attributes are like that of the stereotypical victim in a Gothic text. Use of biblical references to describe him hint at his heroism. He gratefully washes his feet in the fountain. That could be a link to baptism. But it's definitely a sense of protection from hell. This is significant later. Remembering what we know of Jesus washing the feet of disciples, Jesus being a saviour, we can assume that the Englishman is, in some sense, meant to be the saviour of the Countess. So symbolism of death as a sexual awakening, in some respects, is also about the killing and warding off of the evil spirits that hold her to ransom. As we engage with the rose as the first of the four symbols that run in conjunction across this story. I think it's crucial to acknowledge that roses historically are associated with love, with femininity and with sexual desire. In this story, they mock the Countess's sexless existence in her prison. She says, I leave you as a souvenir the dark fanged rose. I plucked from between my thighs, like a flower laid on a grave, on a grave. So here Carter is evoking this sense that the vagina is what's described <laughs> by alluding to the rose's fangs, by referencing thorns, just as she's able to kill, not kiss on the mouth. The Countess is unable to experience pleasure from her thorned vagina. The rose is dead, like the Countess, and her chance to experience love and sexual fulfilment is also robbed from her too. In deep contrast to that, the symbolic nature of light floods her mansion and castle at the end, showing this existence to be false. Symbolically, light reflects reason, invading the realm of the supernatural, showing it to be no more than an illusion across this story. When the Countess's voice confirms, I was only an invention of darkness, we are led to be drawn to the illusion that, in this instance, the Englishman is the symbolic saviour, much like the potency of the light. Now we come to this, the caged lark, not free. And it's interesting, the Countess is fascinated by this image. She cannot be free herself, and so gazing into a caged animal gives her a sense of control. And it's another example of her power across this story. It's not just power and grip over the young Englishman, in some respects, it's the power and grip that she chooses to have on all that she can have. Crucially, you might ignore the symbol of the bike, but to me that bicycle symbolises 
human rationality. If its functions work on human laws and there's no power beyond its expectation. When the soldier refuses to give his bike to the servant, he is symbolically removing this irrational fear that has crept in. He refuses to be separated from his bicycle and refuses also to be separated from reason. The soldier embodies the light of reason and to some extent his face actually blinds the Countess so much that she must wear glasses in his presence. In some respects those images of light and the bicycle go hand in hand in association to me at least of the power of the Englishman and the images of the lark that's caged and the rose reflect the Countess's attempt at containing control and also her undeniable weakness. Here you can see the range of links to other short stories in the collection from Angela Carter. Whether it's the association of victims dying thinking they're about to have sex as we encounter in Bloody Chamber, whether it's in uh, the cat stories of the courtship of Mr Lion and the Tiger's Bride, the idea that characters inhabit different worlds. In this case we've got the Countess Vampire who inhabits a totally different world from the soldier. Hers is all about murder and bloodshed and his is all about rationality and truth. I think it's interesting the association between our vampire and the maid and the tiger's bride. They both have masks that they wear but they're victims of their own struggle. The snow child in some respects reflects the violent and sexual nature of the images hinted at at least of necrophilia and this sense of disgusting uh, sadistic references to um, the intensity of what power can do to damage. And then finally the brief association of the lark being set free associates with the Earl King. But it's crucial to also acknowledge with you that across the history of literature we have so many reference points to draw reference to that Carter is acknowledging, nodding and even winking to across this short story. As you can see in the top left we have the reference repeated across the story of Eat Me which is obviously an acknowledgement of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. This story subverts the power of Sleeping Beauty, top right, and that's in part because she dies having been kissed and that's not a joyful pursuit. Bottom left, Jack and the Beanstalk. I mean, there's two ways of looking at that one. Um, in the story, it talks of fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of the Englishman. That creates this sense of foreboding. As readers, we know that the Countess intends to kill the Englishman, like every lover she's had before. Dracula, it's more than a passing reference to the Gothic, and that's obviously a seminal text by Bram Stoker. In this particular case, what we're thinking of is the way that Carter uses the Countess as the absolute inversion of what uh, the Count Dracula is like. And then very finally and critically, we shouldn't ignore Dickens's depiction of uh, Miss Havisham. She lives in her wedding dress in a rotting home and centre stage on my slide here, you can see the decrepit home that she seeks to live in. Uh, if nothing else, these heady images all draw reference to this idea that Carter is in her postmodern state, engaging with all that's gone before to make a huge range of critical points. As if that weren't enough, there's even art allusions in this short story. We're acknowledging the power of Renaissance art, where, as you can see here from the work of Botticelli, there are vulnerable victims that are depicted as women. Whilst the Countess becomes a victim, she's a victim of her own power. Her own failings are what kill her, and it's in some strange inversion of events that, in art, these women are depicted as virgins, yet the strength lies in the form of the virgin in Carter's story. These artwork pieces are allegorical of the mortality and frailty of the human form. And in some respects, they mirror the realization for us that the Countess must die. 
I'd love to know in the comments what you think. Thanks for watching.